You are welcome once again to Nest 334. I believe Dr. Aziato has taken you through the course overview. And this is the second aspect. You finish with the nervous, the surgical conditions of the nervous system and general neurological surgical nursing management. So this morning our discussion will be centered around the musculoskeletal and the sensory neural organs. At the end of this session, students should be able to mention some musculoskeletal system diagnostic investigations, types of fractures. You should be able to immobilize fractures, manage patients on traction, and then care for patients in cast. And you should you are expected to be able to mention some clinical manifestations of patients with dislocations. This session seeks to introduce students to the general surgical management of the musculoskeletal system. Specifically, we'll be looking at fractures, dislocations, and it is helpful for you to also remember that as the nurse or as a nurse, you are required to have a good interpersonal skills and then to effectively work with the various specialists that play key roles in performing various surgeries such as bone and joint surgeries. For the outline of our presentation, we will be looking at the definition, incidence, causes, the classifications, signs and symptoms, and management of some of these conditions of the musculoskeletal system. Our first topic is the general surgical management of the musculoskeletal system. Remember, the skills and knowledge acquired from the general surgical management of musculoskeletal system is going to help you apply to conditions like fractures and management of patients with traction and cast. And it's expected that students should be exposed to the orthopedic wards. You are therefore required to have at least a six week clinical experience at the orthopedic wards. By way of introduction, we'll be looking at orthopedic bed and accessories. Remember, beds and accessories in basic nursing. Orthopedic bed is also known as a fracture bed. And when we talk about bed accessories, we have the trapeze. You are being referred once again to nurse 338. And um, you're going to look at the bed accessories. We have trapeze. We also have sandbags, the footboards, and we have backrests. All these are accessories that help in managing or nursing our patients with musculoskeletal problems. We'll also be talking about positioning of our patients, diversional therapy, prevention of uh, constipation, because a lot of our patients are confined to bed, and this is a predisposing factor to constipation. we also talk about patient nutrition, which plays a key role in healing of fractures and then musculoskeletal conditions or injuries. We'll talk about traction care, wound care, plaster of pari or cast care, and then of course we need a physiotherapist to take patients through physiotherapic exercises in fractures and other injuries of the musculoskeletal system. Then of course, we should also bear in mind that patients may need certain assistive devices to enable him or her to be able to walk. Then first of all, let's look at care of a patient in traction. Traction will be discussed in detail when we come to fractures because it's one of the treatments or management of fractures. First of all, the nurse should check that the weight is hanging freely. You should also ensure that you maintain a continuous and straight traction. Hence, ensure the sandbag is well positioned and the pulleys are straight. 
And this continuous and straight traction, or maintenance of a continuous and straight traction, is going to help promote reunion of bone, as well as bone alignment. And you should also ensure that you support the foot with sandbags to prevent foot drop throughout the treatment period. Observe patients for foot drop, and then the heels of the foot should also be placed on a sandbag to prevent pressure source. And that talks about the bed accessories discussed earlier on. In the picture, we have a patient in traction. So those are the pulleys with the sandbags attached and the ropes you can see, as you can see in the picture, are straight and hanging freely. Ensure that the bed clothes do not impinge on the ropes. Then, another important area for the nurse is observation. Patients' interaction should be observed for skin irritation. This is because skin irritation is one of the predisposing factors or we say precipitating factors for the development of pressure sores. Observe also that the site of pain insertion, especially in skeletal traction, for signs of infection. How do you know the site is infection? infected? There will be discharges and we may also have a lot of passive discharge from the site and the wound delays in healing. Remember, the use of aseptic technique to clean the site is very important in skeletal traction. This means that in skeletal traction, apart from the general care for both skeletal and skin traction, there's a need to do dressing of the site of pain insertion, and this should be done and the strict aseptic technique to prevent infections to the bone, which is very difficult to treat. Still under observation, we also need to assess the patient's vital signs, temperature, pulse, respiration, and blood pressure. And then the pressure areas should also be observed for early development or early detection of pressure sores and then treatment. Then we also give or administer anticoagulants and anti-embolism medications as ordered. And a typical example is heparin. Patient has an injury to the bone. There's a probability that there's a blood clot formation in the tissues. And this blood clot can dislodge and then circulate or go to general circulation, resulting in embolism. Therefore, there's a need for heparin. Active exercises should be encouraged to promote good muscle tone, depending on the patient's condition. And then the patient should also be encouraged or advised to take nutritious diets and also help promote healing. There's a need for high protein, high vitamin C diets, intake of vegetables or minerals and vitamin-rich foods. These foods or some of these fruits and vegetables may also help prevent constipation. Now to the earnest care or management, we want to talk about cast care. Cast is also known as POP or plaster of Paris. And with this, the patient who has a fresh cast should be received into a fracture bed with minimal handling. This is because the minimal handling is going to cause indentations. So to prevent dents or indentations, minimal handling should be ensured. And then we also ensure we prevent pressure on bony prominences. The cast is allowed to air dry. How do we ensure this? Patients can be placed on a divided bed and a bed cradle may be used to lift the weight of the bed clothes of the cast. 
tasks must be handled with care and it should not be handled with the palms to prevent indentation and pressure. It should be handled with the palms instead of the fingers. Cast once again, the nest ensures that the cast are handled with the palms rather than the fingers to prevent indentation. And then the patient is turned every two hours to ensure that the cast has an even dry or dries evenly. It's also important to observe that the edges of the cast do not have any irritation or redness. So there's a need to observe for irritation as well as redness. And this implies inflammation. You should also observe the part beyond for edema that is the extremities of the site or the part where the cast has been applied should be observed for edema, cyanosis, pallor, warmth, and pulsations. So that's in the picture we have a patient in cast. And we should also remember to elevate the part if it is swollen. The patient should be told to eat high protein, vitamin C, D, and iron diet, and then also to avoid wetting the cast. He or she should also be told to avoid putting sharp objects in the cast and should also report any feeling of numbness, burning sensation, tightness in the cast immediately. Patients should also be taught appropriate crash walking technique and then a physiotherapist may be involved in teaching patients the crouch walking technique. Exercise up above the part of the cast is also important and patient is also taught deep breathing exercises we want to prevent hypostatic pneumonia and other respiratory complications associated with immobility. The site is also inspected for signs of irritation around the cast, and then the, the cast edge and under the cast. And then we should also remember to avoid weight bearing or stress on the plaster cast. In both cases, in caring for patients with cast and traction, we should also remember the personal hygiene and the elimination needs of the patient. Patient is assisted to bath in bed, nail care, care, hair care, as well as mouth care are all ensured or done. All patients assisted to do so. So that brings us to care, the end of care of a cast or a patient with skin and skeletal traction. So topic two is on dislocations and fractures. And with this, I would entreat you to revisit your anatomy and physiology and specifically look at bones and joints. Now, what is a dislocation? A dislocation occurs when the articulating surfaces of a joint are out of normal anatomic contact and the partial dislocation of a joint is termed subluxation and the displaced bone may impede blood supply, tear ligaments, rupture blood vessels and then damage nerves and rupture muscle attachments. And please note that there is a difference between a dislocation and a fracture. And joints often dislocated or which are commonly involved in dislocation includes the finger, the hips, the shoulder, elbow joints, and the patella. So in the picture we have a dislocated hip. You can see that the joint is slightly displaced. 
Now let's look at some predisposing factors of dislocation. It's common with aging. As one ages, he or she becomes predisposed. And then certain occupation predisposes people to dislocation. Example, sportsmen. Malnutrition is a predisposing factor. And then other diseases such as osteomyelitis, osteomalacia, cancer of the bone, and then also in bedridden patients. Now, let's look at fractures. A fracture is a break or disruption in the continuity of a bone, and it's often accompanied by distraction of surrounding soft tissues. We have so many classifications of fractures. And the fact we may have a fracture being closed, or what we term as a simple fracture. And this occurs when the skin is intact over the fractured bone. Open or compound fracture, on the other hand, occurs when the skin integrity over the fractured bone is interrupted. And they are further graded as follows. We have grade one, which is a clean wound less than one centimeter long. Grade two is a larger wound without extensive tissue damage. Grade three is highly contaminated, has extensive soft tissue damage, and is most severe. Now, a complete fracture is when the entire width of the bone is fractured and the incomplete one does not involve the entire width of the bone. To continue with our classification of fractures, we may also have stable or non-displaced fracture and as you can see in the picture, the non-displaced one has a clean cut edge even though the bone is broken and with this the bones maintain their anatomic alignment, but there's a break. And unstable or displaced fractures occurs when the bones move out of their correct anatomical alignment. And that is the second picture. This is what occurs in a displaced fracture. The bones are displaced or they move out of their correct anatomical structure. Then we may also have types of fractures. We finish with the classification. We want to look at the types. We may have a green stick fracture and this is an incomplete fracture in which the bone is bent and it normally occurs in children less than 12 years. The bone is not completely ossified and therefore it's not hard or fully ossified as in an adult. So instead of breaking, it bends, and hence the name green stick fracture, just like a fresh green stick. Then we also have the transverse fracture, which is a fracture at a right angle to the bone's axis. And we have oblique fracture, with this a fracture occurs and there's a break that has a curved or sloped pattern. So there's a slanting sort of break. Then we have comminuted fracture. This is a type of fracture in which the bone fragments or the bone breaks or fragments into several pieces. We may also have an impacted fracture and this is one we or whose ends are driven into each other. They are impacted, twisted, and driven into each other. And it's commonly seen in arm fractures in children and sometimes known as a buckle fracture. We may have stellate fractures and the fracture lines of this type radiate from one central point. So we have a central point and then it radiates. Then avulsion, it's a type of fracture in which the bone fragments are torn away 
from the body of the bone at which the site of attachment of a ligament is located. So with a valve fracture, there are bone fragments. The bones are torn, the fragments are torn. It happens in severe injuries, such as when somebody is run from a moving vehicle or a fall from a tall height. Now we may have stress fracture, and this occurs in individuals who have recently increased their activity level, such as recruitment to army or recent taking up of jogging. Of jogging. So the person starts an activity which he or she is not used to, so there's stress on the bone, and this may result in a stress fracture. Pathologic fracture, on the other hand, is caused by a disease that weakens the bones, and hence the name pathologic. So in the picture is a tibial stress fracture. A fracture. Remember the tibia and fibula in anatomy. So this is a typical tibia stress fracture. Now, how do you know that somebody has a fracture? Sometimes the signs and symptoms of fractures and dislocation may be similar. So one may mistake a dislocation to be a fracture. But let's look at some general signs and symptoms of fractures and dislocations. There may be deformity. There's fracture, there's a discontinuity in the bone, and therefore the part or site involved may be deformed. Then we may also have swelling at the site. There may be bruising, and another term is ecchymosis. There's muscle spasm, the muscles are thrown into spasm. Then the patient or the victim experiences severe pain. There's also tenderness and by tenderness the, the place becomes very painful to touch there's loss of function and abnormal mobility and then crepitus crepitus normally occurs when the bones break in fragments and there's a crackling sound heard around the site of the fracture we may also have neurovascular changes around the site or the extremity of the parts involved. Now let's look at diagnosis of fractures and dislocations. We may diagnose through clinical manifestations and history, like physical examination, through palpation and inspection. The site is palpated for tenderness. Upon inspection, it may reveal um, inability to use the parts or raise or lift the parts that is loss of functional swelling at the site. Then radiographic examination, x-ray examination may also help with the diagnosis of fractures. Bone scan may be done and this involves intravenous administration of radioisotopes and an area of increased uptake or hot spots may indicate a fracture. Then fractures may also be diagnosed through MRI. MRI will be treated into detail in S338 uh, and its magnetic image resonance or resonance imagery. Now we come to the management of fractures and we have the five R's in fracture management. If we look at the principles of fracture management, the first step is that the nurse should ensure that patient is resuscitated. A lot of patients who have fracture often have it as a result of injuries. So the first thing to do is to resuscitate the patient and remember our basic life support in nurse 337, cardiopulmonary resuscitation. Then the second principle is to ensure reduction 
and this entails the correction and the realignment of the fractured bone by traction or pulling. And we may also have restriction on movement and this is done by applying POP or a cast to the parts involved or the affected parts. It can also be done through splinting and bandaging, body splinting, mechanical splinting, and then the various types of bandaging are being referred to next 338. So this help in restricting patient's movement to prevent further damage or complications. Then we may also have restoration of function. And this is where actual treatment of the fracture or bone takes place. A ring zima frame crutches can be used so patients works on it. And then the last R is how to rehabilitate the patient back to become a useful person in society or to go back if not totally to his or her normal state. Now we want to look at traction because traction was seen as one of the principles of fracture management or treatment modalities for fractures. Traction is the process of exerting a pulling force on proportions of the bone by means of a pulley or pulleys or weights. And what are some of the benefits? It helps in gaining or maintaining body alignment in dislocations. It also reduces fracture, corrects mild deformities, minimizes pain, it helps align bones and then rest the parts. It also decreases muscle spasms. We have two main types of traction, even though there are other types. We have skin traction and skeletal traction. Other types include plaster traction, combined plaster and skeletal devices, brace traction used for fracture and bone deformities. We also have circumferential traction used for pelvis or lower back traction and then cervical traction. Other types include a manual traction and this is where the hand is used to directly apply the pulling force and it's usually used when casting a fractured limb. We also have balance suspension traction and this involves more than one force of pull. Now skin traction. This uses adhesive materials applied to the patient's skin and non-adhesive for patients with fragile skin. So non-adhesive materials are used for patients with fragile skin and a pool is then inset, exerted on the fixed material. Because of the relative elasticity of the soft tissues, only a moderate amount of traction can be achieved, but it's generally not considered for a prolonged period of treatment compared with skeletal traction. And it's, however, indicated in pelvic fractures and in this situation may be used for as long as six weeks for the treatment of low back pain. And examples of skin traction include back traction, and Brand's skin traction. Skeletal traction, on the other hand, is the application of a pulling force through placement of pins into the bones. The client receives local anesthetic and the pin is inserted in a twisting motion into the bone. So you see pins and then the ropes attached to the weight pulling or serving as the traction are connected to these pins. And highly sterile conditions are very important in application of skeletal traction so as to avoid bone infections.
and other infections. And the advantage here is that more weight can be used in skeletal traction to maintain proper anatomic alignment if the need be. Now that we've looked at traction, which is also a mode of treatment for fractures, we want to look at surgical management. In some severe fractures, such as hip fractures, where blood loss is excessive, prompt surgical intervention and early mobilization are likely to be successful rehabilitation. And the goal of surgical management is to achieve a stable reduction and internal fixation of the fracture segments in order to support early ambulation. The first one is bone setting. This is the manipulation of a fracture to restore alignment, position, and the length by bringing the fragment into close approximation. And it alleviates compression or stretching of nerves and blood vessels. The types of reduction include close reduction and is done by applying manual traction to move the fracture fragments and also to restore bone alignment. And this is accomplished by the use of appropriate maneuvers and is done under anesthesia. And an x-ray is usually taken after the procedure and this is to help confirm the realignment of the bone. We also have open reduction and with this anesthesia is made and fracture fragments are realigned under direct visualization. It is a treatment choice for compound fractures that are comminuted or accompanied by severe neurovascular injury. In compound fractures, we have a break in the bone as well as the skin. So both the bone and the skin are open to communication outside and open reduction is the best method or the most appropriate method to use. It's usually performed in combination with internal fixation. So open reduction and internal fixation may be done together. And let's look at fixation. Internal fixation involves the use of screws, plates, pins, wires, or nails to maintain alignment of the fracture fragment. And the rods may also be placed through the fragments or fixed to the side of the bone. Or they may be inserted directly into the bone's medullary cavity and it helps to prevent deformity. Now let's look at some devices that can be used for internal fixation. We have the Austin Moss prosthesis. We have the dynamic hip screw, stamen spin, which is the commonest one used. We have the Stetcher's nail or intramedullary nail, Smith Patterson spin, Ambi nail, Kirchner's wires. All these are materials that can be used for internal fixation. An external fixation involves the application of an external fixator and it consists of a frame connected to pins that are inserted perpendicularly to the long axis of the bone. And with these pins are placed through the bone above and then the one below and then the fracture site. And this is to help immobilize the bone and external fixation rods then hold the pins in place. So rods are used as well. A cause is surgery and therefore pre and post-op management is of utmost importance. General pre and post-op management has already been treated and we want to look at some diagnostic investigations that are normally carried out before surgery. The next should ensure that BUE and creatinine as well as full blood count 
blood for grouping and cross matching, chest x ray and ECG have all been done and duly filed. So these investigations may be requested for patients. Then the patients or clients should also be educated on immobilization postoperatively. The skin area should also be prepared for surgery, including the area above and below the joints on the affected side, and this is done on the day of the surgery. But skin preparation will also depend on the hospital's policies or protocol. Some use the platelet creams, and some also do shaving and preparation of the site. Skin preparation, once again, you are being referred to Nurse 352 Advanced Clinical Nursing. Then the part should also be mobilized as soon as patient is put into bed, and this is to help prevent complications. We should also encourage passive and active exercises early to prevent complications such as deep vein thrombosis, stiff joints, and loss of muscle power. The area should also be supported with bed accessories such as sandbags, bed cradles, and bed blocks. Patients should be encouraged to take diet rich in vitamins, protein, and calcium. And this is going to help or assist with early healing of the fracture or broken bone. Then patients should be educated, patient relatives or patients and relatives should be educated on the condition and they should also be asked to give their financial and social support for long absence from work. You know, fracture normally takes a long time to heal and patients may be on admission or confined to bed for a long time, for weeks or months. And this may affect patient's work as well as productivity and his or her role in his or her family. And therefore, this needs to be explained to the patient. So when we talk about um, post-op management, both post-operatively and pre-operatively, patient and family should be given this education to tune their mind to this and also offer words of reassurance and encouragement. The social worker may also be involved as well as a physiotherapist, public or community health nurse. An x-ray of the operator site is carried out after 24 hours post-operatively and post-operatively a full blood count may also be done. So both pre and post-op management is very important. Once again, refer to your general pre and post-operative management. Let's now look at man medical management. It can be managed medically. Patients can be given antibiotics. This may serve as prophylaxis to prevent infection. It may also be used to treat infections. An example, Zinaserf 750 milligram may be given eight hourly for 24 to 72 hours, and then it may be changed to capsules, sclindamycin, 300 milligrams, eight hourly, and may go for as long as weeks or several weeks, depending on patient's condition. IV, expen, and flagell may also be administered for seven days. Such as petidin, 50 to 100 milligrams, depending on patient's age, may also be given 8 hourly or PRN. But note that most patients develop a for petidin and therefore should ensure it is not abused. Then oral or supplement tramadol may also be given 25 to 50 milligrams twice daily for three days. We may also have diclofenac, so oral medications may include tramadol, diclofenac, we have paracetamol, Doretta, all these are oral medications that can be administered to relieve pain. So our medical management, we also have 
anticoagulants. An example is SC fragment, 5,000 units daily for 72 hours or PRN. And this helps prevent thrombosis and embolism. We patients may also be given laxatives to prevent constipation. So suspension lactulose or 10, 10 mils of lactulose may also be given twice daily for seven days. As you know, nursing is integrative. So please revisit your pharmacology for nurses. And under nursing management, if patient has a fixation, the nurse should ensure that he or she observes the pin site for reactions and infections. Example, erythema, tenderness, and then drainage from the site. Assess for deep vein thrombosis, encourage ankle exercise, and use of anti-embolism stocking as prescribed, and encourage quadriceps setting and gluteal exercise early to maintain muscle strength, and it's also useful or helpful for ambulation. Then we should also carry out neurological assessment. Remember, neurological assessment was treated or discussed under general surgical and medical nursing, neurological nursing management. And with that, we talk about we are observing for posture, stimuli, neurovascular status of the patient as well. Then we also observe the pain site and dressing is also done. We want to prevent infection. Avoid positions that put stress on the affected area and then educate clients to also do same. In conclusion, patients with issues of the bone and joints are usually unable to perform self-care activities on their own. It is therefore important for the nurse to assist these patients. So that brings us to the end of our session. And you are being referred to Lemony and Beck's Clinical Handbook for Medical Surgical Nursing, Louise S.M. Hetimka, and we also have Smelter Bear, Henkel, and Shiva for further readings. Thank you.